Well, it's good to see everybody again uh, uh, on the call tonight uh, for the Ministry of the Word of God. We're grateful to our brother Jack Hay from Perth for his help again uh, this evening. Um, just before I hand over to uh, Jack, um, Eric will just commend us to the Lord and then uh, Jack, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Our gracious God and Father, we do thank thee again this evening that we have the opportunity in this particular way of coming together around thy precious word. Now, bless us, God, we know that we need to be fed on thy word day by day, our God, our spiritual food, how needy it is. Now, blessed, our God, we know that thy word is the word which would guide us through all the circumstances of life. We just pray indeed that we might be obedient to thy word, our blessed God. We thank thee that once again tonight we have our brother Jack with us to minister thy word to us. We pray that it might be word which would encourage thy people, our God, in these days when we need much encouragement, but also perhaps to be alerted to things maybe that need changing in our lives. Thou dost know. Now, loving God and Father, we just now commend ourselves to thee in, in seeking thy blessing on our coming together tonight in our Saviour's worthy and precious name. Amen. Well, good evening, brethren and sisters. It's good to be with you again this Thursday evening, and we trust that the Lord will bless our little time together around the Holy Scriptures. Now, as with last week, we're turning to Colossians chapter 3, and we'll just try to take up from where we left off last Thursday evening. So our reading will be from verse number 12, the epistle to the Colossians chapter 3, and reading at verse 12. Just give you a second to find the place, and then we'll start the reading. Colossians 3 and verse 12. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity. In one body, and be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Now, I'll maybe just point out that most translations from about uh, J.N. Darby's translation and onwards, it would maybe just tinker a little bit with that verse as far as punctuation is concerned. Not so much with regard to translation, but punctuation. I, I think, if I'm correct, I, I think that there would be no punctuation at all in the Greek and so the, the folks who were translating, they had to determine where the punctuation would go in as far as the English translation is concerned. So I think most translations would say something like, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, and then maybe a semicolon. And then in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever ye do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Now that is the section that we'll try to get through this evening, and we trust with the Lord's blessing and with the Lord's help. <clears throat> now I never try to use too much time as far as picking up threads is concerned, because I discover it kind of runs away with the time quite dramatically and you always say more than you intended to say but just to remind you that in the previous section the apostle Paul had spoken of the fact that at conversion you put off the old man and you put on the new man and because you put off the old man now you've got to mortify your members that are on the earth and there's a whole list of very, very disagreeable things mentioned, sins that should never be named among the people of God. But then he comes on to say, now, put off these also. So here are other sins that people might think are more excusable. But Paul says, no, no, these things have to be put off as well, like wrath and anger and, and so on. But now he's coming to the positive side of the business. You've put on the new man. What is this going to look like in a positive way in the life of a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ? I love that verse at the end of Romans chapter 13, but put on 
the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. And I sometimes link it in my mind to the burnt offering. Now, brethren tell us often that the burnt offering was all for God. And we know exactly what they're meaning. But there's one exception. The skin of the burnt offering became the property of the priest. Now, whatever would the priest do with the skin of the burnt offering, that beautiful hide that was now his property? Well, what happened to the skin of the, of, the, of the slain animal in Genesis chapter 3. It was used to clothe Adam and Eve. And it seems to me that the priest, now owning the skin of the burnt offering, would use it as a clothing. It would be made into something with which he would be arrayed. And it seems to me that that is what Paul is saying in Romans 30. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. We sometimes sang it when we were young, let the beauty of Jesus be seen in me. And of course, it's a little reflection from a verse in the Psalms, let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us. Now, what does that look like in the life of a believer when someone puts on the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, Paul's going to explain it to us in this passage, and he's explaining there are certain things that in a positive sense you'll put on. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, and so on. So let's go through the verses and notice how it's... Notice we've got a therefore in verse 12. And as always, the therefore links us, for the most part, with what has gone before. And of course, Paul has just been saying to them that Christ is all and in all. He is in every believer. And he's spoken about believers from all kinds of backgrounds and he's saying look Christ is in every one of them now as Paul comes to speak about our interaction with our fellow believers he's saying look you've got to keep in mind that Christ is in every one of these people oh he may have been a Scythian you know the man that was at the bottom of the pile as far as his manners were concerned and so on just remember that Christ is in a man like that. He may have been a man who was a slave uh, on the bottom rung of the ladder socially. Just remember that Christ is in a man like that. And Paul is saying, in effect, your attitude to your fellow believers will be governed by the fact that you see him or her as someone in whom Christ Resides. I tell you, my friends, that would aid us to get our attitudes right as far as our interaction with other believers are concerned. And so he's saying, therefore, in light of the fact that Christ is in these people, you've got to act and think in a correct way towards them. But then he's saying not only you've got to have the right attitude to your fellow believers because of who they are people in whom Christ resides, but you've got to have a correct attitude to them because of who you are. And he's going to tell you about three things that characterize you. First of all, he says, you are the elect of God. And it's as the elect of God that you put on these lovely qualities, the elect of God. Now you would know from Ephesians chapter one, that because a man is in Christ, God has chosen him for a whole raft of spiritual blessings. And so here you are tonight, someone whom God has chosen to be the recipient of a whole range of spiritual blessings. Now, Paul says that ought to impact on your life. The fact that you've been so blessed and the fact that you've been so honoured, God has chosen you for all these things, that really ought to govern you, your attitude to your fellow believers. So he's saying, first of all, you are the elect of God. You've been chosen for a whole range of spiritual blessings. But then he says you are holy. And you would know that basic to that word holy is the concept of being set aside. And of course, you were sanctified, you were made holy on Conversions Day, on the basis of the work of Christ, of course. You remember the epistle to the Hebrews speaks about him that sanctifies and they that are sanctified, they're all of one. So how did he sanctify us? Well, we're sanctified 
by the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So it was the giving of his body that laid the basis of our sanctification. But then when you come to Hebrews 13, it's the shedding of his blood. Same event, of course, it's Calvary that's being referred to, but it's the offering of his body in one passage. It's the shedding of his blood in the other. Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. But that was made good to you personally when you believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the risen Christ spoke to Paul about them that are sanctified through faith that is in me. So the faith that saved you was the faith that sanctified you and you were set apart to God. You became a distinct individual, different from all those around about you. You now belong to God. You are his exclusive property, separated unto him. What a dignity has been conferred upon you. All right, says Paul. Because you've been chosen for spiritual blessings and because you've been set apart to be a distinct individual in contrast to them that go down to the pit, you make sure that you treat your fellow believers well. Then the third thing he says to them is this, you are beloved, elect of God, holy and beloved. And again, that's a wonderful thing. Here we are, erstwhile sinners, and to think that God loved us. Oh, I know that we could just put ourselves in with the whole uh, group of sinners who've been loved by God, God commending his love towards us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. But we love to make it more personal, don't we? And we say with Paul in Galatians 2, the Son of God loved me and gave himself for me. And so there you are tonight, someone who has been the object of divine love. Now, says Paul, the fact that you've been chosen, the fact that you've been set apart, the fact that you've been loved, let that carry weight with you and regulate your behavior in connection with your fellow believers. So he's saying, I'm saying, put on, put on these various things because because of what they are, Christ is in them, and because of what you are, elect, and holy, and beloved. But now, he comes to it and he tells us precisely what we've got to put on. Bowels of mercy. Well, we'll better modernize that one and say a heart of compassion. A heart of compassion. And my dear fellow believers, every Christian man or woman ought to have a tender heart rather than being flinty, stony, adamant. Oh, may God help us to be compassionate people. This is putting on the Lord Jesus Christ. Wasn't he moved with compassion so frequently? Oh, he looked at the crowd one day and he was moved with compassion. And he could say on another occasion, I have compassion on the multitude. But always oh, tender compassion focused on individuals at times. And when he heard that appeal from the leper, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. He was moved with compassion, stretched forth his hand and touched him. Now, let me ask you, do you have a heart of flint or are you moved when you see human need? Are you like the priest or the Levite who have a glance at human need and pass by on the other side? Or could it be that you have compassion on the man at the side of the Jericho road. Now, I, I think in particular, it's in connection with our fellow believers that Paul's speaking here, but it's important for us just to have a heart of pity for our fellow believers in their need. I tell you, there are many in straitened circumstances, and if we're going to help them, it starts in the heart, and we've got to have pity upon them. But that leads to kindness. So you put on not only a heart of compassion, but kindness. Now, again, this is a characteristic of our God. He's kind. Paul to Titus spoke about the love and kindness of God our Saviour towards man appearing. And it's lovely that these two things are brought together. You know, there are some folks who could be kind to others, but in a very cold kind of a way. And it's just an act of charity as it were, and people would dub it an act of kindness. 
But you know, as far as God is concerned, love and kindness are brought together. And so it's the heart of compassion and then the kindness. And so in the companion volume, the epistle to the Ephesians, Paul says, and be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. So I trust like the, the woman in Proverbs chapter 31, the law of kindness is in her mouth for a start. You see, it, it would be easy to be harsh and critical and just to berate people if they deviate from the straight and narrow just an inch. But it is important for the law of kindness to be in our mouths and in a compassionate way to try to draw people back. But beloved, there are those of our dear fellow believers across the broad acres of earth who experience privation and they could do with a little bit of kindness on the part of those of us who are in the Western world. And so he's saying here, look, put on therefore as the elect of God, a heart of compassion, kindness. But then he speaks about humbleness of mind, humility. And again, if you're putting on the Lord Jesus Christ, this was a great feature in his experience. Your mind's away to Philippians 2 already, I'm sure it is. The mind of Christ, the disposition of the Lord Jesus Christ, who being in the form of God. And Paul traces his downward step, down, 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 right down to death, even the death of the cross, humility of mind. One thing that God hates among others is a proud look. And when you think about it, beloved, we don't have much to be proud about. You know, it may be that God has used you and that's a wonderful thing. And he's given you a gift that you've employed and he has been pleased to use that. But Paul says to the Corinthians, what hast thou that thou didst not receive? So there's no credit to any one of us if God has used us. All the glory must be him. It redounds to the glory of God if God is pleased to, to bless. And of course, there's no credit to us at all. Even when it comes to spiritual progress, it's important for us to understand that really we are dependent on God. It is he who has begun a good work in you, who will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. You've maybe been on the road for a, a long time, the Christian pathway, you've, you've trekked many a mile along the route. I know you don't take a scrap of credit to yourself that you're still standing. You look to him and you say, well, if there have been fruits of righteousness in my life, the fruits of righteousness have been by Jesus Christ. He is the one who has cultivated that in my life. And so let us all keep humble. Now, maybe it would be a dangerous thing to ask God to humble you, because God had, has means whereby he can humble people, and it can be a very painful experience. Far better to ask him to help you to keep yourself humble. And so he's saying, this is something you need to put on, humility, humbleness of mind. But then he speaks too about meekness. And again, this is another characteristic of our saviour, put on meekness. Do you remember that even as a king, as a sovereign, he's regarded as being meek. Zechariah 9, your king cometh unto you meek and having salvation. And so he came meek, riding upon a colt, upon the foal of an ass. And mind you, it was a borrowed colt. The sons of David in their day, you know, when, 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 when Absalom was intent on murdering his brother and all the other brothers were gathered up, you know, but when they saw what was happening, they, they all jumped in their mules and headed off. They, they all had their own mules. This son of David that we are thinking about now had no mule, no donkey to call his own. But he was able to say to a loyal follower regarding his beast, the Lord has need of him because the Lord can commandeer the property of his people and he uses it for his own purpose. But it was a borrowed coat. He was meek, you see. 
and he didn't come with fanfare. And even in his preaching, he shall not lift up nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. And he was so tender, the bruised reed he would not break. Oh, my beloved, let us put on what the Bible calls the meekness and gentleness of Christ. David had to say about his nephews too often, ye sons of Zeruiah, be too hard for me. And there's always the danger that we could just be a little too hard rather than having this meekness and gentleness which characterize the Lord Jesus. What a beautiful uh, uh, conglomeration, shall I put it, of moral qualities that were seen in our blessed Saviour. And Paul saying, you put them all on now. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he's saying meekness and long-suffering. And they tell us this word mainly would be long-tempered. That's the idea of the word. Now, normally we use the reverse of that, don't we speak about people being short temper and we say they're in a short fuse and they're like the the bangers that we used to have at Guy Fawkes time you know you like the touch paper and then you stand back about five yards or something like that you know and, and there are people like that and we, we, we thought about it last week people who are volatile people who would be wrathful and there would be these outbursts of a look says Paul here You've got to be long-tempered. And even in teaching the word of God, it has to be done with all long-suffering, says Paul to Timothy. You see, people just don't take things on board overnight. And there has to be the patient teaching of the word of God. So please don't get too upset if you think that someone is just a little bit intransigent and they're digging in their heels. Just work away patiently teaching the word of God with all long suffering, long temperedness. So the apostle is saying, here are things that you've got to put on like that, what conversion you put on the new man. But this is how it looks now in boots as you live among people. And he's showing that these qualities ought to be in evidence in our life. But then coming on to this, forbearing one another. And the inference is that some of the folk that we're associated with could just be the kind of folk that would rub us the wrong way. You know, not, not everybody has the same temperament as you have. And I'm sure that the, the tortoise would get quite upset with the hare at times. In other words, the person who's so laid back that they're horizontal, they really get quite annoyed with the workaholic who always wants to be up and at it. And similarly, the man with that kind of temperament, he, he gets kind of annoyed with the other. Look, we're all of different temperaments and we've all got different backgrounds. And yet Paul is going to show here that as an assembly of the Lord's people, we really ought to be able to live harmoniously with each other, forbearing one another. And it just might be that someone irritates you to the extent that they've actually offended you. Now, Paul comes to that. It's not just forbearing one another, but he says, forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel, a complaint against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do you. Now, I've been racing through this, but maybe I should just pause and ask, is it possible that there's someone on the call tonight who really needs to be of a more forgiving spirit. Maybe you feel that someone has offended you. Now, it may be real, or it may be only perceived. I have a strong feeling that at times, a lot of the slights that people feel are only perceived slights. And a thing has maybe been said that has been misconstrued, and a mountain has been made out of a molehill, and the whole thing has festered. And there's just the possibility that it could be that someone would need to be of a more forgiving disposition. You see, the Lord Jesus has forgiven us. Back in chapter one, the apostle had spoken about that. And he tells us that in him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. And it took the shedding of precious blood 
to effect forgiveness for you and me. So dare we be of an unforgiving disposition when we have been forgiven so much. That's the point that the Lord Jesus made in a parable in Matthew 18. There's a man there who owes 10,000 talents and he has nothing to pay and his Lord forgives him. Now that was an immense amount of money. I don't know whether it was because of misappropriation of funds or maladministration or whatever, but this man was in debt big style and he was forgiven. And the same man went out and found a fellow servant who owed him a hundred pence, a paltry amount of money, really, in comparison to what he'd been forgiven. And he took him by the throat and he would have throttled him and said, pay me that thou owest. And you might say, how disgraceful. How could a man who'd been forgiven so much adopt such an attitude to his fellow servant? How much more disgraceful for you and me whose sins were many and who have been forgiven at the expense of precious shed blood to harbour a bitter, unforgiving spirit toward a fellow believer. Oh, I do trust that each one of us knows something about the ability to forgive. And of course, Peter asked, how often should I do it, Lord? Seven times? Well, maybe he was thinking of the time that the Lord said, if your brother says to you seven times in a day, I repent. Well, you'll forgive him seven times in a day. But uh, no, the Lord says, not seven times, Peter. 70 times seven, 490. Do you think someone's going to start counting them out? I forgave him once, twice. And when it gets to 491, you say, I'm drawing the line under it at that. Not really. The Lord Jesus was saying, in effect, forgiveness is something that must keep going on. I know you'll likely expect a huge apology. And you'll really expect the people to grovel towards you. And you'll maybe make your stipulation. Did God make any stipulations when he forgave us? For Christ's sake, he forgave us, says the epistle to the Ephesians. And so, for Christ's sake, surely we can forgive our fellow believers if necessary. So, Paul's saying, look, forbearing one another, and uh, if, it, if we do forbear one another, the need for forgiveness would come into play. But, you know, if, if there should be some word spoken out of turn or some action that was taken that you feel to be to your detriment. Here's the next step, forgiving. Now, I, I know, I know that if a brother has offended you, there's a whole scenario that has to be gone through according to Matthew 18. But I do trust my beloved that we get the attitude right, first of all. You're putting on these things. You want the right attitude in your interaction with fellow believers. And so he's saying, as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. So you, you've put on these garments and they're all delightful, aren't they? How, how beautiful are these if you're attired in them? But now Paul's saying, here's something to put on that will hold the whole thing together. So he says, and put on love, above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfectness. The bond, that is, it's the kind of, well, they would have called it a girdle in these ancient times, the belt that holds the whole thing together. Here's the umbrella term, if you like, that encapsulates all of these other qualities. Love, and this is agape love as we speak of it. I wonder, my beloved, if we do have a deep affection for our fellow believers. We used to be taught when we were young, it's the badge of discipleship. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye love one another. But of course, when you come to John's epistle, it's the evidence that a person is a genuine member of the family of God. We know that we've passed from death to life if we love one another. Now, you would know that love in John's epistle is not just a, a glowing sensation in the, in the heart, not a willy kind of feeling in the heart. 
You know, I used to get upset when I was a young people, a young person, and the preachers were inciting us to love our brethren. And I was finding it difficult to work up these emotions of affection that I felt I was being called upon to exhibit. But then I discovered in reading the word of God that love is not just an emotion. It's practical. And so says John in his epistle, let us love neither in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Even the world says actions speak louder than words. And so you wouldn't really need to tell a person that you love them to let it show. You know, that we had a preacher in Scotland, Mr. Peyton, and, you know, he came away with some very great one-liners at times that just hit the nail on the head. And he would have said to us on occasions, you know, uh, it's a good job some people tell you they love you. You see what he was saying? You would hardly know if they didn't tell you. Well, the point in John's epistle is it's not in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. It's in these acts of kindness and compassion and forgiveness that Paul has been speaking about. But that's how the love binds all these things together. And so he's saying above all these, put on love, which is the bond of perfectness. And then in verse 15, he speaks about the peace of God. And at, uh, I think most translations would say the peace of Christ. So you've got the peace of Christ in verse 15, and then you've got the word of Christ in verse 16. Of course, the word of Christ is the word of God. It's a little incidental evidence of the deity of the Lord Jesus, that the word of God is called the word of Christ. But of course, essentially, the word is all about Christ. And we've been seeing that it's Christ who exemplifies all these moral qualities and all these exhibitions of tenderness and affection that he's been speaking about. So it's the word of Christ in that sense too. But first of all, he speaks about the peace of Christ. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. Now, this isn't the peace of chapter one. In chapter one, he says of the Savior, he has made peace by the blood of his cross. And very obviously in the context here, it's the peace of reconciliation. He's reconciled all things unto himself, things in heaven and things on earth. So the shedding of the precious blood of the Lord Jesus has effected reconciliation in that sense. He has effected peace by the blood of his cross. But I take it this is more to do with the peace the tranquility that God is able to impart to human hearts. And, and remember, we're in a context where he's speaking about our interaction with each other in the assembly, and he's saying, let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also you are called in one body. My beloved, God has done a great work in this world. And of course, it's in the epistle to the Ephesians that it's outlined for us in greater detail. But here they are, Jews, Gentiles, centuries of hostility had existed between them. A middle wall of partition had been there. And now converted Jews and converted Gentiles have been brought together. And he is our peace. And we've been called into a sphere of peace. And so when Paul begins to apply that practically in chapter four of the Ephesian epistle, he tells us that we have to walk worthy of the vocation wherewith we've been called. And if we're walking worthy of the vocation with which we've been called, among other things, we'll be endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. The common factor in every believer's life is the residence of the Holy Spirit within. And he has created a peace in this great entity that's called in Ephesians, the church which is his body. And now Paul is saying, I want that to be seen as worked out practically in the local assembly situation. Let the peace of God rule in your heart. So you ask yourself the question, if I behave in this way in the assembly, how's it going to affect the peace of the company? 
if I insist on doing this, how is that going to affect the peace of the company? So there is a sense in which congregationally, we've all got to allow the peace of God to rule. Uh, and that word rule is to be like an umpire making the decisions. And I ask myself, if I do this, how will that affect the peace in the company? But then to apply it to our own lives, let the peace of God or the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. How is it going to affect my tranquility? Will it cause me twinges of conscience if I do this or that? Will it cause me to be uneasy? And when it comes to guidance, this is maybe one of the factors we have to take into account. It's not the whole story, mind you, and guidance is not my theme tonight. I sometimes think that if someone advertises that they're going to speak about guidance and they're going to make it easy for us, well, you can nearly fill the town hall with a congregation to hear about a theme like that. But guidance is not our theme tonight. But one factor is, would I be at peace if I do this or that? Oh, it's maybe something that I don't have a, a black and white injunction for in the word of God. There's no, thus saith the Lord, or thou shalt not, or whatever. Uh, but it's something I do need guidance for in my life. And I take it that the green light does not shine until at least we have peace in our heart about the issue. It is the umpire. It is the deciding factor. The peace of God. So he's saying, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which you're called in one body. Remember, I've, I've spoken about the one body and the peace that has been created. So we've been called to a situation of peace in one body. Let that be worked out practically in congregational life and in our individual lives. And then he adds this, and be ye thankful. And of course, the people of God are duty bound to be thankful. And right through this epistle to the Colossians, the apostle speaks about gratitude. I mean, you come to verse two of chapter four, continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. And of course, he himself has set the pattern away back in chapter one, and he gives thanks. And he's praying for them, among other things, that they'll be giving thanks unto the Father. So, Giving thanks is a theme that bubbles to the surface here and there, right through the epistle to the Colossians. And here he's saying, and be ye thankful. In a difficult year. And maybe you think, well, there's not a lot to be thankful about. Really? <laughs> I tell you, my friends, the old hymn, I don't know whether you have it in your hymn book, South of the Border, but in the Redemption Songs hymn book, we used to sing it. Count your blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. There's so much to thank God for. I sometimes think about old Anna in this connection. The Bible says she came in that instant and giving thanks. She was one who spoke of him to all that look for redemption in Jerusalem. So in speaking of him, she had a lot to give thanks for as she reflected on him. So she gave thanks for the fact that the long promised Messiah had now arrived giving thanks. I hope then that each one of us are grateful. You see, in Romans chapter one, you discover that ingratitude is a feature of a pagan environment. Neither were they thankful, says Paul. And you'll discover in 2 Timothy chapter 3 that, among other things, ingratitude is a feature of the last days. Men shall be unthankful. And there's always the possibility that what is current in the world around us could seep into the assembly. And we just forget to give God thanks. Ah, says the apostle to the Thessalonians, in everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning. It's not the whole will of God for your life, but it's will of God. There's no definite. Uh, here's part of the will of God for you, that in everything you'll give thanks. And of course, in the parallel passage in Ephesians, 
being thankful is an evidence of being filled with the Spirit, giving thanks always for all things. I sometimes think it would be easier if he'd said giving thanks sometimes for some things, but no, the bar is high. Giving thanks always for all things. And so he says here in our passage tonight, and be ye thankful. But then having spoken of the peace of Christ in verse 15, he now comes on to speak about the word of Christ in verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And I, I think maybe we could put in the little semicolon there. You see, you've got to allow the word of God to the word of God to dwell in you. It means, of course, reading the word. And it means meditating upon the word. Psalm number one, the blessedness of the man who has got a love for the word of God. In it doth he meditate day and night. The Lord Jesus said in the 40th Psalm, Yea, thy law is within my heart. And so it comes into the head because you've got to use your thinking facilities to understand the word of God. Well, I know that's not the whole story. You're dependent on divine illumination. Indeed you are. But Paul did say to Timothy, consider what I say, and the Lord will give you understanding in all things. In other words, he's saying, you'll never get an understanding of the truth of God if you don't consider what is being said. So we've got to apply our minds to what the Bible is actually saying to us, and we consider it. But it gets from the head, the cerebral area, and it gets down into the heart. And I think that that's what Paul is speaking about here. It's not just the peace of God being an umpire in our hearts, but the word of God's really got to get down into our hearts as well. It has to dwell in us. Let the word of Christ dwell in you. And of course, it's as it dwells in us, it's as it is uh, cloistered in our hearts, it will then find expression. And we do the will of God from the heart. So, what about it? What, what about our Bible reading? Are we careless about it? Spasmodic in the way we attend to it? Just maybe rushing a chapter or two for the sake of getting it ticked off as having been done in inverted commas? No, let, let's be more earnest in our approach to Scripture than that and to, to let the Word dwell in us richly, richly, having its effect upon our lives. How often I've attended meetings and at the start, the brother opening the meeting has prayed to God that we might not be forgetful hearers, but doers of the word. And of course, he's, he, he's in James chapter one. And in James chapter one, the apostle James is saying this, look, it's not just a case of looking in the mirror of the word and then forgetting about the whole thing. You've really got to implement it. The blessing is in the doing. That man shall be blessed in the doing, in the deed, says James. So let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. But then here's another statement. In all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another. In all wisdom. Now, it is true that sometimes we've got to teach our fellow believers truths from the word of God. And it is true that sometimes they have to be admonished. Now, that word admonished is the idea of giving a warning, particularly by bringing something to remembrance. And so Paul, for example, at Ephesus could say, by the space of three years, I ceased not to warn, every, to admonish every one of you, night and day with tears. And it's only as we can bring the word of Christ to bear upon a situation that it provides for the believer teaching and admonition. So you, you can see, if you're going to be a help to somebody else, you've got to first of all let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And as it has its effect on your life, you're then in a position to teach and admonish other people. But notice this, Paul, it's got to be done in all wisdom. In the next chapter, he'll speak about wisdom, and it's more there in connection with our attitude to those outside. Walk in wisdom towards them that are without. So 
as far as the assembly is concerned, there is a within and a without, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. The membership of an assembly is not a nebulous thing. It's not something you would hardly know who is in fellowship with you. No, there's a stated membership, as it were, a within. And that's why Paul says to the Corinthians in chapter 14, if the whole church be gathered together in one place. And you'll notice that when the whole church is gathered together, it is not a private meeting. A New Testament assembly is not a secret society. And so when the whole church is gathered together, there will come in outsiders, as we might call them, the unlearned, the unbeliever. But please do observe that they are distinct from the whole church. So that's why I say there's a within and there was a doubt, a stated membership. Now, as far as those that are without are concerned, unsaved people or people whom you might to use a modern language, people who are not in fellowship, you've got to be wise in your interaction with them. Of course, to the Thessalonians, the apostle will say, you've got to be honest. You've got to walk honestly towards them that are without. But in the Colossian epistle, walk in wisdom towards them that are without. Because if you're not wise, in the way you deal with people, I tell you, it can have horrible implications for assembly testimony. So we need to be wise in connecting with those who are outside. But Paul is saying here, we do need to be wise in our interaction with each other, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another. So if someone has to be taught truth, and if some warning has to be given, it must be done sensitively. You know, the bull in the china shop approach is no good. It really will be counterproductive. The thing has got to be done in all wisdom. So he says in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another. And then in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Sometimes people say that word grace could mean thankfulness and well, we're singing with thankfulness in our heart to the Lord. But at the same time, it could be just a reminder that, yes, grace has touched our lives. And it's in response to the grace of God that has been expressed towards us that we have the spirit of praise. And in, in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, we are singing with grace in our hearts to the Lord. Now it could be that even the, the teaching and admonition can be conducted in some of our spiritual songs because although he's saying that uh, we're singing to the Lord, Paul in the Ephesian epistle does say it was speaking one to another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And so for example we, we use the Believer's Handbook, we have done traditionally where I am uh, in fellowship and not all the hymns are addressed to God. And so sometimes we'll sing a hymn like, Brethren, let us join to bless Jesus Christ, our joy and peace. He who bowed his head so low underneath our load of woe. And sometimes even in our teaching meetings, we sing hymns that are addressed to each other. Take time to be holy. Speak oft with thy Lord, and so on. The lesson is this. If hymns are going to be effective, then they must be scripturally based. Now, I know that if you were to discard every hymn where there is some kind of slight thing that you wouldn't be too happy with, you maybe wouldn't sing too many of the hymns. But all I'm saying is this. as a lightness about some hymns. And there are some hymns which are patently, not doctrinally sound, and we ought to avoid them. And we ought to be singing to one another things that are biblical and instructive, even with the children, I would suggest. You know, in your children's meetings and in your Sunday schools, let the choruses be Bible-based. Now, to be frank, I don't mind maybe one, what I would call novelty chorus. Uh, thrown in, you know, just to keep the children happy to a certain extent. 
There's one, what I call a novelty chorus that I would always sing in the schools when I was in, you know, I try to have good Bible based uh, gospel choruses for them. But, uh, you know, they the, the love to sing and it's Bible based too. 12 men went to spy in Canaan, tw 10 were bad and two were good and with all the actions and they enjoy singing a thing like that and, and that's okay. But at the same time, I, I think even get the gospel into the children and the things that you sing with them. Because there's the suggestion here that even in the singing, we can be teaching and admonishing one another. But basically, the singing is with grace in our hearts to the Lord. And so we're addressing our worship, our praise to the Lord. Well, I was saying that we've a lot to be thankful for as far as lockdown is concerned. But I would have to admit that one thing that I do miss is the singing. And uh, we, we, we certainly feel that we're missing out and we wonder when we'll get back to it because they tell us that we're really, if we're really singing out, we're spreading the thing like wildfire. But anyway, we'll just need to wait and see. Maybe the vaccination will get us all back to singing again before too long. But anyway, it's singing to the Lord. But now he goes on to say, and I'm keeping my eye on the clock here, he says, whatsoever you do in word or deed, and really, in you, when you get to, into this passage in Colossians and into chapter four, there's so much that he's speaking about, about word, about word, you know, and it's prayer and then uh, making the thing manifest as I ought to speak, and then let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt. So there's a cluster of items there at the beginning of chapter four that all have to do with speaking. So he's saying here, before he gets to that, whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. That is with his authority. You wouldn't do anything without his backing. You wouldn't do anything without a thus saith the Lord or biblical authority, if I could put it that way. So you're doing it in the name of the Lord, he's saying, and giving thanks to God the Father by him. So we learn a little thing about prayer and thanksgiving here. It is addressed to God the Father, but it is through him. So we don't pray to the Lord Jesus, and we certainly do not pray to the Holy Spirit. The preponderance of New Testament prayers and expressions of thanksgiving were to the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is borne out here and in the parallel passage in Ephesians chapter 5. Incidentally, let me say this. In the parallel passage in Ephesians chapter 5, it is prefaced with this. Be filled with the Spirit. And he'll show you the things that will take place if you are filled with the Spirit. Now, in this passage, it's prefaced with this. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And what takes place when a person is filled with the Spirit is exactly the same as what takes place when a person is allowing the word of Christ to dwell in them richly. So all I'm saying is this. There is nothing mystical about being filled with the Spirit. It just has to do with the control of the Holy Spirit in a person's life. And it, it is as the person submits to the teaching of the Word of Christ that they are filled with the Spirit. Now, I think it's important for us to understand that. So here he's saying, yes, you'll be giving thanks to God and the Father by him. But whatever you're doing, in word and deed, you're doing it in the name of the Lord Jesus. Further down, he's going to say to slaves, and whatsoever ye do. Now, they, not so much in word and deed there, but it's whatsoever they do. You see, the slaves wouldn't have much of a say. They, they wouldn't be able to speak back. In fact, Paul says that to the slaves in Titus chapter two, not answering again. And maybe there's just a principle there as far as those who are in employment are concerned. Don't be a smart aleck type of person who always has a quick response to the boss and is cheeky in the workplace and so on. Not answering again. So Paul is saying here, slaves, whatever you do, do it heartily 
as unto the Lord. For of the Lord you'll receive the reward of the inheritance. Slaves, an inheritance. The two things don't go together. Slaves don't get an inheritance. But in the spiritual realm, Christian slaves will receive an inheritance. If from the Lord they'll receive the reward of the inheritance, for they serve the Lord Christ. So in the workplace, they're serving the Lord Christ. It's nothing to do with preaching the gospel or anything. Like that. It's just, well, in our language, eight to five or nine to five or whatever it is, you're serving the Lord Christ. You're serving the Lord Christ. So he's saying, do it heartily. You know, when I used to work, which was many, many years ago, I haven't been working since 1972, but when I used to work, there was a girl in our office and she was, she was great as far as getting things done was concerned. You know, she just, she just could do it. And if you told her to do something, I was just slightly senior to her. And if you told her to do something, you could be sure it would be done quickly and it would be done well, but it, 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 it wasn't done heartily. Whenever you asked her to do something, well, there's always a touch, you know, and, but it got done and it got done quickly and it got done well, but it definitely wasn't done heartily. So the apostle is saying here to slaves, whatsoever you do, do it heartily. So we've got a phrase in our verse, whatever you do, in word or in deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the time has almost gone, and I don't want to encroach on this next section. It's a completely new section that he's about to embark on. Or is it? Or is it? You know, I've been speaking of the fact that we've put on the new man. And, and how does that work out? What does it look like? Well, he's going to come on to show what it looks like in the home and in the workplace. Because there's nothing airy-fairy about Bible teaching. It affects the lives of, of, of every one of us 24-7. We're only in the assembly, I don't know, if you're not having a special series of meetings, you're maybe just in assembly meetings five or six hours a week at the most. But at your work, 40 hours a week. And you're in the home, I don't know how long, every week. And the Word of God as principles to govern all of these hours as well. So he comes on to that, wives, husbands, and so on. But we, we're not going with that tonight, or you'll miss your bus if you've got a bus to go and catch. But anyway, we'll pray and ask the Lord's blessing. Father, we come to thee again in the precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're so grateful to thee for Holy Scripture, and we thank thee for the instruction that we find therein that would regulate our lives as believers in the Lord Jesus. We thank thee that he is the supreme example of all these delightful moral qualities that we've been thinking about. And we pray thee that each one of us might be able to replicate these features of Christ in our own lives. So we commend ourselves to thee, asking thee again to bless every dear believer in connection with the assembly there at Uxbridge and those who've been in the call from other places. Bless every household, we do pray thee. We need thy help, Father, constantly. We do know that for some of the dear believers, the lockdown is lonely, and there are others who just can't see family, and uh, we all feel deprived of opportunities in the service of God. But, our oh, Father, we do pray thee that we might see thy hand in it all and help us to be able to say like the apostle, I have learned in whatsoever state I am to be content. So we commend ourselves to thee and offer our thanks in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now, thank you again for Amen. the opportunity of being with you. And uh, I'll hand you back to Alistair now. Thank you, Derek. We do appreciate your help both last week and this week. Very much appreciated. Uh, and uh, uh, it's been good to see you again. Thank you. Nice to be with you. And thank you all for attending. Appreciate it. Good. I'll say amen to that. <laughs>